Hello everyone, it's Lasley here welcoming you back to the Ace Attorney series retrospective. Last time around, I talked about the original Phoenix Wright Ace Attorney, and by original, I do mean the original first four cases, as well as Justice for All in its entirety, because that one was only four cases. And for part two of the Ace Attorney retrospective, I'm going to be talking about Rise from the Ashes, and then we're going to finish up the trilogy by talking about Trials and Tribulations, which was actually the first Phoenix Wright Ace Attorney game I've ever played. So some general things to go over here is that uh, Rise from the Ashes was originally made after the original trilogy. So as a result, there are some gameplay differences. By that I mean it actually takes advantage of DS's unique touchscreen and microphone functionalities. But other than that, it's not too terribly different from the rest of the series. It's more so kind of a tie-in to Apollo Justice, which is Ace Attorney 4. Because a lot of the stuff that's introduced in Rise from the Ashes, gameplay-wise, and to a lesser degree story-wise, gets reintroduced or talked about again in Apollo Justice Ace Attorney. It's just the way it is for that. But other than that, Trials and Tribulations is more or less a continuation of Justice for All. It's more of the same gameplay-wise. There aren't any new drastic additions like the Cyclops system that was introduced in Justice for All. And on a story level, it's one whole case longer, but it's more so a case of it being two flashback cases that are a little shorter than usual. So it's five cases, but it isn't really the traditional length that newer Ace Attorney games follow. So without further ado, let's start talking about Rise from the Ashes. Okay, I'm not gonna sugarcoat this. Rise from the Ashes is very, very long. It's about as long as Turnabout Samurai and Turnabout Goodbyes and the first Turnabout combined. And that's if you know what you're doing and you're not dawdling about figuring out what to do next. But does that mean that this is a poorly written or poorly paced case? No but it is kind of a shock to go from Turnabout Goodbyes to Rise from the Ashes, which is almost twice as long. But the question is, does it use that length well? For the most part, I do feel like they could have condensed it a little bit, but if you were to look at Rise from the Ashes as more of a standalone piece, rather than something part of a larger narrative, I think then it's a little bit more palatable. At any rate, the story of Rise from the Ashes sees Phoenix Wright defending a prosecutor again, but this time there's a twist. The prosecutor has a sister, and the sister is Emma Scott, who is uh, a high school student. Yeah, who bears a slight resemblance to Maya Faye. I wonder if that's the reason Phoenix decided to take the case. I think it's implied, but I can't say for certain. And Lana Sky, who is the defendant in this case, bears an awfully similar resemblance to Mia Fey. In this case, there's no spirit channeling, no Fey's at all. I don't even think Mia Fey makes a cameo as a spirit, like what happened towards the end of Turnabout Goodbyes, no. So if nothing else, this is definitely one of the more uh, straight, I guess, straight arrowed? <laughs> I don't know what the word, what word to use here. Phoenix Wright Ace Attorney cases prior to Justice for All, well, uh, until we get to, like, the second trilogy, I guess, where 
there's nowhere near as much spirit channeling at all there too, but that that's a whole nother point of discussion. But yes, you're defending M you're defending Lana Sky. Emma Sky is going to assist you. And it's interesting because she's into forensics and all that stuff. Forensics is actually, honestly, a r really cool and, and interesting field. And thankfully, because this was made from the ground up for the DS, you get to use the DS's touchscreen and microphone to do some interesting things gameplay-wise throughout the entirety of Rise from the Ashes, including fingerprint dusting and luminol fluid thingy. Well, you use luminol fluid to find blood stains, basically. You do a lot of this mostly during the first two investigation chapters. You still do it a little bit in the third chapter, but not as much. And yeah, it's worth bringing up the chapter structure because they really put a lot of meat into each and every chapter structure. And the trials go on for so long that all of them are split into two or three chapters. So, any rate... Once you uh, are introduced to Emma and Lana, you move on to the parking lot, and you run into someone named Angel Starr, who is a former detective who works as a lunch lady of sorts. But the twist is, she witnessed Lana murder Bruce Goodman, who is the victim, apparently, through the fence. Alright then, so you investigate the parking lot, and then you meet up with Edgeworth again in his own office, which is, this is the first time in the series where you actually go to his office, and funnily enough, you don't really come back to it until the Ace Attorney Investigation sub side series, I guess you could say. And that's another series that takes advantage of the DS, DS functionalities, because those were made from the ground up for the DS as well. So, yeah. But it's interesting because Edgeworth kind of goes through a bit of a character arc here that sort of ties into what happens with Justice for All since this does take place in between the first game and the second game, but because it was made after the third game, it can be a little weird at times. How they kind of retcon, but not really. I wouldn't pay too much stock into Edgeworth's character arc in Rise from the Ashes, but it's still interesting, and hey, it's a justification to have Edgeworth as the prosecutor after, you know, he couldn't be the prosecutor in Turnabout Goodbyes, which is kind of funny to look back on when we get to Dual Destinies, but I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself once again. At any rate, after investigating Edgeworth's office, you don't really get much on the first day, and investigating the parking lot, we start learning a little bit more about the other characters involved. And uh, admittedly, the first investigation chapter is the least interesting because you don't learn as much as you do in the later ones. But you do get reintroduced to Gumshoe. Uh, Gumshoe is technically not the detective on this case, but he's still around to help out as much as he can. The, re the detective instead, well, not really because he's more of a patrolman, but he's still involved, is Jake Marshall, who's a... Uh, yeah, he has a weird obsession with Wild West and Cowboys, so I hope you like that sort of thing. I do like his character design, but other than that, eh. Oh, his theme is good, though. That, that, I will say that about the music for Rise of the Ashes. They are some bangers, even to listen to outside of the context of this game. But anyway, we move on to the first trial, and we get more information from Angel Star, who's dishing out lunches to the Judge, Edgeworth, and Phoenix Wright all throughout the trial, which is kind of hilarious to watch, but uh, it's mostly for not because you find out that there's a lot more to this mystery than meets the eye, because while it seems like Lana stabbed Bruce Goodman, there might be more to this than meets the eye. So the second half of the trial, first trial chapter, we're introduced to Damon Gant. I'm going to say this now, his theme is one of the most earworm themes in the entire series. I'm thinking about it right now while I'm talking about talking about it. I can't get it out of my head. And if you hear it in the background of this retrospective, uh, don't blame me. It's a catchy theme. What can I say? But uh, basically, Damon, uh, or I should say Gant, uh, starts talking about things that happen. He talks about an incident that happened in the evidence room, as well as some other things that will come to fruition later on in this case. So we've got back to investigating, and the second investig investigation chapter is where things get 
a considerable, considerable amount more interesting because it is now where you're definitely using luminol and fingerprint dusting a lot more. And you'll be doing a lot of that, especially in the evidence room, where you do this for like two or three different evidence lines. But by doing this, you start to get the feeling that something, that the incident that happened in the evidence room may or may not be connected to what happened in the parking lot with Lana. There's also Mike Meekins. Uh, you talk to him and you find out he was involved in that incident as well. Supposedly, he's the suspect that killed, supposedly, so uh, let's just move on to the trial, the second trial. And the first half is dedicated to cross-examining Mike Meekins. Oh god, okay. I'm gonna talk about this character for a little bit. I like his character design, and I'm gonna tell you the reason why I like his character design is because it reminds me of old-school anime, particularly Lupin the Third for some reason. And that's the only thing I really like about this character, because having to cross-examine him is kind of annoying, and when he talks, sometimes he'll talk with the microphone, and that makes a screeching sound, which isn't as bad as it could be, but still kind of annoying to deal with. Another thing you learn about is that you get a video, and you have to examine the video a couple times. And there is this, there's something that like this that happens again in Apollo Justice, but there's a big difference between how the video examination is done in this particular situation versus how they handle it in Apollo Justice. That, me, that leads to people often criticizing Apollo Justice for this, but not so much Rise from the Ashes. It also helps that you don't really deal with the video after this second trial, second trial session of Rise from the Ashes, so yeah, that definitely helps. But by examining the video, you find out uh, nobody might have... I don't think anybody died in that conflict. What happened is that, is that Mike Meekins saw someone go into the evidence room. He followed them, he tried to attack them, and the person fought back and they escaped with nothing but like, but like a cut on their shoulder. But you find out in the second part of the second trial, oh boy, it's kind of a mouthful, that Jake Marshall takes the stand because you find you found his fingerprints uh, that were wiped off on the locker. Uh, I can't remember if it was his locker or if it was another locker, but you find his fingerprints. You have to get him to the stand, and he starts to testify, and eventually, uh, yeah, he just confesses that he tried to go into the evidence room because he wanted to get some evidence about a case. I can't remember the exact name or code for the case, but this was the case centered around the Joe Dark killing, which was centered around a serial killer, but supposedly, even though he was guilty of killing a bunch of people, the way that that went, the way his trial went, is that someone forged evidence, and he got a guilty verdict because of the forged evidence. He probably would have gotten the guilty verdict regardless, but because of the fact that evidence was forged, and towards the end of this trial, Lana comes out and basically confesses as much, this puts the gallery into turmoil, into chaos. And as a result, you have to go through one more investigation and one more trial chapter before this can truly conclude. The third investigation chapter is the longest, and you don't do as much of what you were doing gameplay-wise in the second investigation chapter. You instead focus more so on Gant himself, and you also get to go to his office and investigate stuff in his office. And you find a safe, and inside this safe, you find some interesting pieces of evidence. One is a strip of cloth, and the other is a shard of a jar that you previously assembled, most of it in the evidence room, but because it wasn't fully assembled, it didn't really have much of a purpose until now that you are able to finish and complete it. Towards the end of the chapter though, unfortunately, Gant shows up and kicks you out. Totally not suspicious at all. To save a little bit of time here, we're gonna move on to the final trial chapter, which is split into three chunks. Oh man. The first chunk is mostly centered around, uh, well, at this point, is mostly talking about the Joe Dark killings. So Emma comes up to the stand to testify what she remembers of the incident. And get this. So she was a witness, and she drew what, she, what her memory was able to recall of the incident. Something like this happens like in the end of the trilogy, 
uh, the end of Trials and Tribulations, where someone draws something and it, everyone's been getting the wrong uh, impression of it, gets misinterpreted. In this case, though, it's because what Emma drew was on the back of an evidence list, and the evidence list is was split into halves. Was split into two halves. You find this out during the trial. And you find out on the drawing the shape of what looks like the blue badger, which is something that was mentioned uh, a couple times up to this point. Uh, the blue badger was introduced in this case, and it gets brought up again in Ace Attorney Investigations. But anyway, it looks like the blue badger, but in actuality, it was the unstable jar, as it were. It was tossed for some reason. And yeah, basically the first trial chapter of the third trial is dedicated to, talk, to figuring out Emma's memories, and a lot of it centers around that dang jar. It's kind of hilarious. Uh, you move on to the second chapter, and this is when Gantt starts to become a lot more vocal. Because you start to feel like, with all of his actions and everything, things start to get quite suspicious. At this point, it's easy to assume that he was the one behind forging the evidence, and also killing... Jake's brother, Neil Marshall. So, yeah, long story short, you go through a lot of that stuff, and by the end of it, uh, Gantz pronounced guilty. How he's pronounced guilty is interesting, though, because there's this thing called evidence law, and because of the way that the evidence was acquired, I'm talking about particularly the strip of claw, your phoenix can't present it unless it gets approved by someone in a certain position of power, like Damon Gant, who is the chief of chief of police. But, if he, if he had presented it when Gant wanted him to present it, Phoenix would have been in hot water, and the case likely wouldn't have gone in favor of the prosecution. But because Phoenix pretended not to have the evidence at first, he made Gant expose the fact that he knew that Phoenix had the evidence, and then he went, goes on for a while to explain why the evidence is significant. And that is when Phoenix can present the strip of claw, and well, what happens from there on is pretty easy to guess. We'll just say, and, you know, just to keep things at a good pacing, I'm just gonna uh, skip right to the ending. I do want to say, Gant's breakdown is really good. Both, both of them, actually. I mean, there's really only one breakdown, but there's like another animation he does where it looks like he's getting struck by lightning. It's really visually striking, in a good way, I gotta say. So, you know, all's good, and then all's well, then ends well. The sisters are reunited. It turns out Lana was forced to be Gant's accomplice in a lot of things, because she thought Emma was guilty of killing Neil Marshall by accident. But it turns out it was Gant who killed him, and then he forged all that evidence, and then he you know how this goes by now. But yeah, that's pretty much Rise from the Ashes. It's it's an alright case, standalone. It is a little long. I'm gonna say this. It, it could definitely get its point across if it was maybe like an hour or two shorter. The first investigation and the stuff with Angel Star definitely could have been abridged. I feel like the importance of Rise from the Ashes doesn't really start to show until the first, until the second investigation and the second trial. If you started from there, instead of the Angel Star stuff, I feel like the pacing would have been just a little bit better. But I think a lot of the point of the Angel Star part is to point out the fact that the stuff that happened at the parking lot was suspicious and may not have been what actually happened, I guess. But yeah, that's Rise from the Ashes, and that's... Uh, the bonus case for the original Phoenix Strike Ace Attorney. It's really weird to talk about this one in the context of the original game since it was made after it, and it doesn't really tie into the first four cases all that much at all. That's which is why I chose to talk about it now at the start of this part of the retrospective. I should have probably talked about this at the end, but I feel like if I talk about this after the final case of Trials and Tribulations, it's going for most. One seven-hour case to another seven-hour case. It would have been a lot. I feel like for the sake of the pacing, it was better to do it this way. At any rate, I'm going to be taking one of those breaks that I take. And when we come back, it's time to start talking about the one that got me into the series to begin with. 
Phoenix Wright Ace Attorney Trials and Tribulations. And we're going to start off with its first case, Turnabout Memories. <laughs> is actually a flashback case, and this is the first time in the series that they've done this. And this won't be the last time, not even within the same game. Uh, so turn about memories, here's a fun fact. This was actually the very first case I ever played, because Trials and Tribulations was the first Ace Attorney game I ever played. So, I mean, that's not the worst starting case in the world. I mean, the first turnabout and this are about on par in that regard, but yeah, trying to play this game as its own thing is fine, but playing it at, as the end of a trilogy is just so much better. But anyway, Turnabout Memories, uh, we're reintroduced to Mia Fey. This is her, actually her second case. It's not the first one. It kind of makes you wonder. We're also reintroduced to Marvin Grossberg from the first game. I don't think I talked about him very much during the Ace Attorney retrospective, but... Uh, there's not much to say, really. He's Mia's mentor, and in this case in particular, he makes a joke about his hemorrhoids for some reason. I don't know why the localization team decided to go in that direction, but it's very weird. And we're also introduced to Phoenix in his younger day. Well, not young, young like when he was in elementary school, like the, you know, the classroom case of, uh, turnabout goodbyes, but it's... Younger, but not youngest days, I guess you could say. And, uh, yeah, he's accused of murdering his uh, classmate Doug Swallow. That's uh, quite a bit too swallow. But anyway, since this is a first case, you're up against Winston Payne. And you'll notice that he's sporting a lot more hair on his head than what we're used to. Kind of makes you wonder. He's also sporting a fancy green suit. Uh, yeah. But, uh, yeah, the point of this case is that there is a murder and you have to cross-examine Phoenix to find out why. But the point is, after going through all that, eventually you find out that there was another party involved. A witness, apparently. And this witness is named Dahlia Hawthorne. And you might want to remember that name. Because as you find out through further cross-examination, other than the fact that Phoenix has a fascination with cold killer X, and he's also dealing with a cold during this case, for some odd reason, you'll find out that Dahlia is not quite what she seems, and very quickly, turns out, yeah, she's evil, and she was the one that killed Doug Swallow, because, yeah, of course. But it turns out, it was actually a poisoning, or an, an attempt to poison. She was attempting to poison somebody, and, uh, through finding that out, you'll get a clue as to another case later on in Trials and Tribulation. But for now, it's not really so important as it is important to fact to point out that she killed Doug Swallow, and she's convicted of murder, and Mia won. But it's not like this was the first time that Mia has dealt with Dahlia. It's heavily implied that this is not the first time throughout the case in the writing. So I don't think I'm spoiling anything. I, not that it really matters at this point, because if you're watching part two of a retrospective, you're probably not caring about spoilers, but still, 
gonna try and be respectful for pe for people. But, I mean, that's basically turnabout memories, you know, the enjoyability of being introduced to a younger Phoenix, a younger, slightly younger Mia Fey, and you get to hear her objection voice clip and all that. The judge is the same, though, and Marvin Grossberg uh, wears a red suit for some reason. I guess the red suit kind of dull into the orange we saw in the first game. I don't know, I guess maybe people were listening to that part of the retrospective and they're like, Well, you didn't talk about Marvin Grossberg, the best Ace Attorney character ever. And I'm like, I mean, he's more infamous in this case, I feel, because of the stupid hemorrhoids joke, but that's besides the point. Oh, and at the end of the case, after you prove that Dolly is the murderer, uh, Winston loses all of his hair in an epic animation. And yeah, that that's pretty cool. But, uh, yeah, that's really all I have to say about Turnabout Memories. Uh, this was the first case I ever played, and honestly, the only case that would have been better for me as a first case was the first Turnabout, so... This was a good way to introduce myself into the series, but it's still not the one I recommend. So without further ado, let's move on to talking about a far more interesting case, and the first real case that got me hooked into the series, The Stolen Turnabout. Don't let the grandstanding in the intro fool you with the whole mask to mask thing. This is nowhere near being similar to Turnabout Big Top, which also had a grandstanding with a certain magician. No, this is quite a different beast. Because starting off, uh, this isn't a murder case. It's actually more of a civil kind of case where you're trying to figure out who stole the Karayan Sacred Urn which was somewhat important back in Reunion and Turnabout and Justice for All, but it gets a little bit more of a spotlight this time around. And since this is the first real case of Trials and Tribulations, it makes you wonder why they're going out of their way to bring back or spotlight all of the stuff that happened back in Reunion and Turnabout. Which is uh, interesting. It's interesting in retrospect. But more importantly though, as you delve into the investigation for the Stolen Turnabout, you're introduced to a certain ace detective. Uh, no, an ace detective is not gumshoe with a promotion, but uh, wouldn't that be something? Uh, gumshoe with a promotion, but no. It's someone named uh, Luke Zavari. Uh, I'm sorry, Luke at me. <laughs> yeah, Zavari. I fooled you there with the Zavari. It's Luke at me, because the pun is that he wants you to look at him, because he's apparently hungry for fame. A lot more to this guy's uh, character arc, though. And I don't know, am I the only one that anytime I read his dialogue, I think of the voice of Cosmo from the Fairly Odd Parents? That voice actor? Uh, Darren Norris, I think his name was. Yeah, I think of that guy's voice when I think of this guy talking. Especially when he says, Zivari! Like he's a magician of some sort, but he's not. He's actually, uh... Ooh, not a very good person at all, you'll come to find out by the end of this case. But, most importantly, we're reintroduced to the best Ace Attorney character ever, 
and I'm only exaggerating slightly, uh, Adrian Andrews returns from Farewell My Turnabout. Uh, I guess she's the equivalent of Lotta returning in Reunion and Turnabout, but thankfully, unlike with the Lotta Heart situation, Adrian Andrews is used just enough. She's re I believe she's reintroduced just to give the player information on the fact that she has gotten better with herself, mentally, since the events of Farewell My Turnabout, which is a good update because I do feel like she's a character that some people will get attached to. So getting that update in the Stolen Turnabout, it's nice. It's nice. It's nice. But you'll find that her role in this case is definitely diminished heavily. She was a key part in Farewell My Turnabout, but she's more of a minor cog in the greater machination of the Stolen Turnabout. And that's fine. That's really fine. We're also introduced to a new character, a couple new characters actually, the Delights. Uh, Ron Delight and Desiree Delight. And yes, that is how you pronounce that name. I don't know if Desiree is American in origin. I don't really care too much right now to delve into that. I'm just letting you all know that that's how it's pronounced. So, yeah. Anyway, Ron Delight is apparently Mask to Mask, or possibly a fanboy of Mask to Mask. You're not really too certain during the first investigation chapter. You're also reintroduced at the very end of this section, uh, Larry Butts, after his noticeable absence in Justice for All. He's all of a sudden back in the picture, just for this one little part, where he's giving you back Ron's wallet that he just so happened to find. And while the wallet isn't too important now, it will become important during the second half. So, to save a little bit of time here, there's stuff about the urn, there's stuff about Luke at me being the ace detective. He's very suspicious with the way he acts about mask to mask as well. And we're introduced to the delights and reintroduced to Larry Butts just a little bit. But we go into the trial and we're introduced to a new prosecutor again. But there's a difference. We're not dealing with a whip happy teenager. Because, yes, 18 is still a teenager before people start arguing. But we're not dealing with one of those types. We're not dealing with a Von, with a von Karma at all. No, this guy comes completely out of nowhere. Unless you're replaying this, but if you're playing this for the first time, definitely out of nowhere. And his name is freaking Godot. And that is how that name is pronounced as well. It's not Godot. Because good lord, do, do, do not any of you listening to this have an ounce of culture within you? Know of the French Godot. At least I think it's French. I don't know. But it's pronounced Godot. So there you go. He's uh, very into the coffee. His, his, his origins are also pretty mysterious. That's all we're told as far as his character in the Stolen Turnabout. Also, he hates Phoenix Wright. But th then again, doesn't every prosecutor hate Phoenix Wright? At least at first. I know Edgeworth warmed up to him pretty quickly because, you know. They have that connection. And Franziska probably didn't start warming up to Phoenix until the tail end of Justice for All. But, you know, it is what it is there. But no, this guy, he hates Phoenix right straight up. And it, will, will he turn around? Well, you just have to wait and find out. Because that turnabout is going to take a lot more of a build-up than this stolen turnabout. So the first trial, uh, you start to cross-examine all the usual suspects at first. You know, Gumshoe lays the facts out, and then we move on to Luke at me for the remainder. I think there's a little bit of Ron Delight testimony here too, but that is not as important now as it is in the second half. But we listen to Luke at me, and the way he talks about Mask to Mask, them being rivals and all this and that, it's all grandstanding. Because apparently, Luke at me is Mask to Mask, and he was, and he was the one stealing everything, including the urn. Which you find out because Desiree goes to his office behind his back. And this is during the investigation where Phoenix goes to the office. He sees a black bag and he feels inside of it and he feels something round which he thinks is the urn. But it's not confirmed until this moment when Desiree brings in the bag. And lo and behold, there's an urn in there. But the only way to prove any connection to Luke at me is by checking the fingerprints and looking for Phoenix Wright's fingerprints. Wow, that's kind of brilliant actually how that worked out. 
And that's actually kind of a running theme in Trials and Tribulations. You're going to find a lot of small loopholes that will be turned and blown up to gigantic proportions at least two more times I can think of for the remainder of this game. And both of those moments are just glorious. Alright, they're glorious. Long story short, Luke at me gets arrested for being masked to mask, and Ron Delight is pronounced innocent of being the thief of the sacred urn of Karayin. I believe that's how it's pronounced. My bad. But at the end of this trial, because there's no way that the second case of the game was going to be that short, right? Godot comes in and lets you know that no, Ron is now suspected of murder. Specifically murdering his former boss, Kane Bullard, who we learned very little of, and that's okay. So we go into the second investigation, which obviously has a different focus. We're going to have to investigate things like what happened to the urn during transit for, to the museum. That's where it was. That's where Adrian Andrews works. The museum that displays all of the unique arts of Karain, or Karain, or however the heck it's pronounced. But yes, the story behind all that. And we also dig into Ron's backstory as a former security guard and all that stuff. And we get some more dialogue with Larry Butts, including the first time in the series where you use a cyclop, or you have to break a cyclop. And this won't be the last. Oh, oh no, this won't be the last, or you see, of the Butts. But he's only in here just enough to help with the security guard stuff, thankfully. He's not overused yet, but anyways, we get all that sorted out, and now we're heading back to the trial. Oh, by the way, there's this funny dialogue with Adrian Andrews where she talks about how she messed up the urn. She's really ashamed about it. You have to break some more side blocks on her, which I I, feel, I felt bad about, because you did that twice already on her in Farewell My Turn. You had to do it a third time just to find out that she accidentally broke the urn and then rebuilt it back to the way it was before Pearl messed it up, back in Reunion and Turnabout, I thought that was a really fun moment. And that was a good closure to Adrian's arc. Although really, her arc was kind of concluded at the end of Farewell My Turnabout. But, you know, this little interactivity in Stolen Turnabout, I would say puts a nice bow on that package. And I'm very appreciative of that. I do find that her fashion sense is still on point here too. It's not as, but you don't get to see the full outfit because she's not in trial, so you just see she has a black top, so, you know. But, yeah, anyway, we go into the second trial, and it's, it's a different vibe, definitely. You start off by talking to Ron. You don't talk to Gumshoe again, which is interesting since the case does become a murder case, so you think Gumshoe coming in to reestablish everything would be understandable. Maybe he does, and my memory is messing with me, but when I remember... Like, the first half of the second trial is pretty much uh, dealing with Ron's testimony. That he can't possibly have been at the security office, and there's no way he could have murdered the guy. Which, you find out he was there, but of course he wouldn't murder the guy. But then you find out a lot more about the backstory between Ron and Luke Atme, and shock and surprise, Ron is the real Master Mask. And Luke at me is a phony. He's a big fat phony. Big surprise with the way he acts at the grandstand and the surviving and all that nonsense. So you have to go to the other courtroom. I think it's the one over. You get to see Winston Payne for a brief second. They're just about to hand down the verdict on Luke at me. But Phoenix comes in with the last minute objection and he says, We're not done yet, Chief. We're not done yet. So. This is where it gets good. You start to cross-examine Luke at me. You find out confirmation on his history with Ron Delight that he was blackmailing Ron Delight to steal stuff. And it turns out it's like a chain of blackmail. Kane Bullard is blackmailing Luke, and Luke was blackmailing Ron Delight, but also giving Ron Delight the plans to steal all the stuff. So Luke at me was kind of the brains behind Mask the Mask. Ron was just be everything else. So, you know. But, through further cross-examination, you find out there isn't really any definitive proof that Luke Atme was at the security office when the murder had went down. 
until he makes a slip up during the final cross examination. It takes a little bit of Deus Ex Mia, but I think in this situation it's kind of understandable. Like I said, I don't think she's overused, but she does kind of come close. Yes, Mia comes back uh, in Maya's body for the first time uh, since Reunion and Turnabout, I believe. But another connection to the last game's second case. By the way, people consider this a filler case like Turnabout Samurai, and I'm going to set the record here. This is not a filler case. A lot of important stuff happens in this case. Why would you go from uh, Farewell My Turnabout all the way to the last case of Trials and Tribulations and then you're not going to know who the hell Godot is? Like, come on, man. Anyways, you find out that Luke Atme mentioned something about Rob the Light wearing the Mask the Mask costume at the security guard office. But here's the thing, that wasn't something that was known until Ron Delight's cross-examination earlier that same day. So the only people that supposedly should have known about that information were Phoenix, Godot, the judge, and everybody else that was in that courtroom. So how in the heck would Luke know this? Because he was there, and he was the one that murdered Kane Buller. That's... it's brilliant! Alright? That's a brilliant loophole! And it's a shame that it took Mia to point that out, but A, at least it was done, and that was an excellent turnabout right there, let me tell you. And the, hey, Trials and Tribulations, this is a game that's full of, there's still at least one more really epic moment of this. It's just, it's just a shame, it's just a shame it kind of happens in a real filler case. This is not a filler case. The next one arguably is, but it's a really good one, and that's recipe for turnabout. If there's one more thing I can say about Stolen Turnabout, though, before we close this off, I really like the chemistry between the delights. It is a delight to read, honestly. The way that Desiree implies that she hates criminals. Ron is supposedly criminal because he was stealing all that stuff, but it's more like she just, she's not a fan of cowards, which a lot of criminals are in a way. It's a very good observation. So, yeah, there's an interesting dynamic between those two. I really think this is an underrated case. But anyways, all I have to say about that, there was a lot to say for a second case, but hey, this was the first real case. This was the case that got me to be a fan of the series, so there it is. So anyways, moving on to find the recipe for Turnabout. Two cups of sugar and one scoop of cream. That makes the recipe for usually what I drink in coffee, but we're not talking about that. We're talking about recipe for turnabout, the third case of Trials and Tribulations. Fun fact though, apparently this was originally meant to be in Justice for All, but it was apparently put off for whatever reason. Either way though, now it's a filler case in Trials and Tribulations, and you know it's a filler case because we're defending Maggie Bird again, just like we did in the Lost Turnabout. But there's an interesting twist with the intro to Recipe for Turnabout. Apparently, we already tried to defend Maggie Bird, 
and we already got a guilty verdict. So you see, Stolen Turnabout and Recipe for Turnabout both have different and interesting premises. Noticing a theme here with Trials and Tribulations, and it's a very good theme, I might say. At any rate though, since this is a filler case, I may not have as much to say, but that doesn't mean there isn't stuff to enjoy here. For one, the character roster is just something else. Uh, early on, into the investigation, you run to this old man named Victor Kudo, and then when you go to the trial, it's just... it's about what you'd expect at this point in the Ace Attorney series. You just go in there, and you just throw in his bird seed. he just wants to say what he wants to say. Ah, man. Truly a national treasure, or kimono embroidery, or whatever it was. And yeah, it's nice to see Maggie again, to be sure. Uh, she, she gets to be more fully fleshed out, I guess, since, you know, Lost Turnabout was a tutorial case. And then there's Jean Armstrong. Or is it Jean Armstrong? I couldn't tell you. French pronunciations can sometimes be, uh, inconsistent. Especially when you're not a native French speaker, who has at most had one French class ever in their life. So... Fun fact, though, uh, sometimes Armstrong will use Spanish instead of French, because the name of the restaurant is Trevien, which uh, is supposed to be French, but I'm pretty sure it, there's some that could be Spanish, because Bien is Spanish for good. Or maybe I'm thinking of Bueno. Like I said, there's a lot of overlap. <laughs> I'm not even really talking about the story of Recipe for Time about, am I? But I mean, it's an interesting story. Phoenix is framed by. Curio Tigre, and you learn this fairly early on, so when you go to the trial, of course Godot is back. But here's the thing though, so the dude that got murdered, right? Glenn Elg. Interesting fact, his name is a palindrome. Glenn Elg, spelled backwards, is Glenn Elg. And he was murdered by someone at the restaurant, and apparently nobody saw the person that poisoned his coffee. So they assumed that it was Maggie that killed him, because she was the waitress at the time, even though she was passed out. Really weird how that happens. But it turns out, the whole thing was a setup. There was actually two scenes that all of the witnesses had to witness. Of course, this doesn't become a revelation until uh, practically the last third of the case, but still. There's also the part where Maya dresses up in the waitress uniform, and then out of nowhere, Mia gets channeled, and wouldn't you know, you get some fan service out of nowhere in this filler case, and that's the only thing that Mia does in this case, which I guess is par for the course with the third cases. Uh, I mean, she had a much more significant role in Turnabout Samurai by comparison, but mostly just calming down Cody Haggins back right then. You see, this is a similar situation where she's calming down Victor Kudo so you can actually talk to the wise guy. There's also an interesting revelation with Godot during the trial where you find out he can't see red on white. Hey, wasn't there someone named Red White? You know, we uh, got him found guilty several cases ago. Hmm, interesting coincidence there. There's also Glen Elg's boss, uh, Lisa Basil. Again, it's a palindrome. Uh, but she's not really a huge character of importance, honestly. You get more backstory on Glen Elg and the fact that he has a serious gambling addiction. And because of this gambling addiction, he has to. He loaned money from Furio T. Ray. And, well, that's why he got round up in his business with T. Ray. You also find out about Tigre's, uh, significant other, question mark? Viola Cadaverini? That's fun to say. Cadaverini. It's Italian. I think it's supposed to be Italian. Uh, yeah, her backstory is honestly really depressing. Like, and when you start seeing that she's crying about it all, and yeah, you kind of get attached to that yourself. You kind of, you know... Uh, hand wave all of her quote unquote creepy behavior and whatnot. Yeah, definitely a very sympathetic character, which is arguably the only real 
dark spot in this case because it's otherwise a really wacky case. Which uh, really ties into the final trial. Not so much the first part. The first part is Armstrong's testimony where the revelation about the two setups thing happens. What's funny is his lie that there was like a giant mirror to try to explain all of the minor contradictions that happen. <laughs> minor. Some of them are actually quite major, but you know. Uh, you find out fairly quickly that the mirror was a bunch of BS because Armstrong owes money to T. Gray as well. Man, I'm, you gotta you, you sense a pattern there, for sure. There is definitely a pattern there. And then, the best part is when you get to the trial with T. Gray. And it's the best part because T. Gray is such an obnoxious character. But it's the kind of obnoxious personality that I'm sure everyone has dealt with at least once but most likely 10 times that amount in their lifetime. That's actually kind of amazing. But what's really amazing is how Phoenix gets t with the bluff. Taking Glenn Elg's ear medicine and trying to pass it off as the murder weapon, the bottle of potassium cyanide, and t just fell right for it. And Tigre has a pretty solid breakdown, too. He just roars, shatters the lights in the courtroom, and is frozen. I mean, how does it get any better than that? There's also a whole thing throughout the case with Gumshoe and Maggie, which is kind of adorable, I guess, but there's also a pretty significant age gap. Not sure how I feel about that, but at least it's a 20-something and a 30-something, so... But the way they act about the whole thing is pretty charming. I will say that much. And, yeah, that's all I have to say about Recipe for Turn, though. It's a filler case, but it's a fun filler case. This is the opposite in quality compared to Turn It Big Time. But without further ado, I'm not going to dwell on this one much longer. I'm just going to go ahead and move on to a far more interesting case. And I consider this basically the prelude to the final case of Trials and Tribulations kind of the part one to case five's part two which is something you may want to keep in mind when i talk about dual destiny and spirit of justice in particular so yeah next i'm going to be talking about turnabout beginnings but i'm going to take a sizable break because like i said i'm probably going to talk about that one and the one after that back to back so emotionless. You've got to be more expressive. Nobody in the audience will be touched by your performance. Hmm. I'm working so hard, I, I can't smile. <laughs> you can't help Thank <laughs> you. 
<laughs> yes, there's that smile. What you were missing was that beautiful smile. Very good. I can smile like this because you helped me. Thank you. This case is about half as long as Recipe for Turnabout, maybe even less than half as long. I feel like there's a lot more to talk about. Being that this is actually Mia's first real case, and oh boy did she pick a bad one. Her first client is a death row inmate, and she's also going up against Miles Edgeworth in his debut case. Nah, we, you want to talk about a recipe for trying to go, okay, I really need to stop using that joke. So, well, we're not really introduced to that many characters when you think about it. Most of the characters here are characters we've already come to know and love one way or the other. Except for the judge. The judge is actually new. But apparently this is Canadian judge. I don't think that's the official name. I think that's just the name that the fans have given him. Because apparently he's meant to sound Canadian. I, I guess I can see it. I mean, he has a blonde beard and might be a little bit younger than the judge we know. I think they're siblings, uh, I believe. I believe he's briefly mentioned in the next case. Uh, again, I could, even though this is a flashback case, this is arguably the part one to case five's part two. So in a lot of ways, they kind of work together. And that's why we got Turnabout Memories as the first case, and we get this later on. But the important thing to take away from this case is we're introduced to someone named Diego Armando. And he bears a striking resemblance to Axel from Kingdom Hearts. <laughs> Just, I mean, he kind of does, but that's not the point. The point is, he looks an awful lot like Godo minus the face mask. It kind of makes you wonder if they're cut from the same cloth. Maybe they are, but we don't find out about that until the freaking final case. So, for now, just enjoy Diego Armando's similar coffee addiction. Although, it, I guess it's not nearly as focused upon since he's just Mia Fey's uh, assistant on the defense attorney team. So, you know. But, the important thing is, besides the fact that Gumshoe is here and he's sporting a much fresher looking coat, and is also a fresh detective here, because this is years ago, we're reintroduced to Dahlia Hawthorne, but she's going by the name Melissa Foster, because of course she is. Using a fake name because she faked her death during a fake kidnapping that went awry because of the victim. They're like stepsisters or something, Dahlia wanted the jewel, and uh, the steps that, I don't know, this seems like it was kind of like a plot hole in a way. They never really explained why the sister turned, because it was supposed to be a plan where all of them were in on it. Dahlia, 
uh, Valerie and uh, Terry Falls, the defendant in this case. Yeah, they were all supposed to be in on it, but Valerie turns on Dahlia and Terry. They never really explained why, it just seemed to happen out of nowhere. I guess because she's a cop, maybe she pretended to be in on it, but it was uh, was going to turn them in or something like that. I don't know. But that's not really a big, big important factor here. The big important factor here is the fact that, you know, this is where Dahlia's evilness is firmly established if it wasn't already established in the first, well, turnabout memories, I should say. The way this case, you know, turns out, by the way, uh, Edgeworth, younger Edgeworth, it's kind of crazy how much younger he looks compared to the Edgeworth we know and love. He's only supposed to be like 20 years old here, but in like Trials and Tribulations, say, I think he's only supposed to be 26. So in six years, I don't know, he looks like he might have aged like a decade or more instead of only six years. Makes you wonder if it's all the stress from all these cases he's had to deal with, you know? But, yeah, the way this case ends up, you, it's similar to what ha happened in Turnabout Memories, except it's the worst case scenario. Terry Falls, when he's asked to come testify, he's already uh, taken the step that Phoenix did during Turnabout Memories. Difference is, when Phoenix did it, the bottle was empty. Not so much this time around, though. And, well... I won't really go into too much detail, but basically, uh, Terry was never found innocent or guilty because he couldn't be found innocent or guilty anymore due to the results of this case. I won't explicitly say what happened because, well, I think YouTube is against the, even saying the word, but yeah, I'm sure those of you listening know what I'm talking about. Basically, this case is that re-reminds the player of Dahlia's evilness because she's going to be important in the final case of Trials and Tribulations. Reintroducing Edgeworth is important. Uh, reintroducing Mia Fey, not so much since she had a presence in Stolen Turnabout and Recipe for Turnabout. Even if the role in Recipe for Turnabout was hilarious fan service, the whole role in Stolen Turnabout was a definite return to form. So, yeah, that's all that needs to be said about Turnabout Beginnings. I honestly thought this would go on a little bit longer, but I think I've said everything I need to say about this. There's some other minor stuff, too, but it's honestly pretty silly to comment on. Like the scarf and the kidnapping note and all that stuff and the whole Terry being in love with Dolly. Oh, God. But it was all part of Dolly's scheme anyway, so it's besides the point. At any rate, though, that's part one of the finale of Trials and Tribulations. In just a little bit, we're fixing to talk about what some might argue to be the best case in the trilogy, maybe even the best case in the series, the final case of Trials and Tribulations, Bridge to the Turnabout.
hope you're sitting down and uh, you have some snacks because I've got a lot of things to say about Bridge to the Turnabout. Fitting because it's actually the longest case in the trilogy. And why shouldn't it be? It's the epic finale not only for Trials and Tribulations, but for the trilogy as a whole. And there is so much amazingness to behold here. But it does start off a little slow. Basically the premise is Maya wants to go take a special course, training course, in the Hazakura Temple. Actually, it was suggested by Pearl, so that automatically makes it a more interesting proposition. So basically, Maya drags Phoenix along for this, and the first half of the investigation segment, the first one, is dedicated to this. But towards the end, there are some interesting revelations. First of all, there's someone that bears a striking resemblance to Dahlia Hawthorne, but apparently her name, this woman's name, is Iris, not Dahlia. I mean, they're both named after flowers, and they both seem to have the same face. The only difference is their hair color is different. Okay, good enough for me, I guess. No, not good enough for me, Dan, but, well, there is a reason for this. But you don't, we're not going to find, we, we don't find out about that until quite a ways into the case. So, again, it's a slow start. We're newly introduced to Sister Bikini, who is basically the nun, or nun, or whatever you want to say, acolyte, whatever. But she's basically like the mass, well, master of the Hazakura Temple. She's like the head nun, basically and she's in charge of taking care of Iris. It's kind of a mother and daughter relationship in a way. We're also introduced to someone named Elise Donum. And yes, that is definitely the accurate pronunciation there. I'm pretty sure it is French. Weird though. But anyway, Elise Donum, who takes a fancy to Pearl for whatever reason, and Pearl takes a fancy to her because apparently she's a famous picture book artist. But who would have, who would have guessed? The interesting thing is, she has a protege, an apprentice. Who is this apprentice? Well, they didn't reintroduce him in Stolen Turnabout for nothing. We're introduced to the grand debut of Loris Donum, also known as Larry Butts, and that's how he will always be remembered, for better or for worse. Nobody sticks to the Loris Donum name except for a couple characters that don't actually know about this whole, you know, his, his whole stick. That if something smells, it's usually the butts. You see, usually, if something smells, it's usually the donum. You see, that doesn't have the same ring. It really doesn't. But yeah, we're, apparently he's here being the apprentice for Elise. Why is Elise here? Well, heck if we know. We don't find that out right away either. But the interesting thing is, Phoenix tries to talk to Iris, but towards the end of this uh, first investigation segment, the some things go down, as per usual with the start of these final cases. So Maya gets trapped on the other side of the Hazakura temple, because there's like a bridge, there's this dusky bridge. It was a pretty important setting in Turnabout Beginnings, because that was where the whole kidnapping thing went down. And also the murder of Valerie. Dusky Bridge gets lit on fire because of a lightning strike. What are the odds? Phoenix, without even thinking about it, tries to go to Maya's rescue because the bridge was still up. It was on fire, sure, but it seemed like you could still walk on it. Of course, the bridge collapses underneath him and he falls to his doom. He doesn't die, but he gets a really bad cold which puts him out of commission, which makes you wonder who will take over for him during the next investigation segment. And welcome to one of the best twists in the trilogy. Edgeworth gets called upon to act as a standing defense attorney for Phoenix until he gets over his cold as much as he can in one or two days. So, for the rest of this investigation segment, as well as the entire first trial, we get to play as Edgeworth, more or less. And it's great, honestly. It's really great. The whole, the whole thing is great. You don't really move the plot too much in a major way, unfortunately. Uh, it might have been an intentional decision. 
there are some revelations, to be sure, but it kind of takes a backseat to the whole fact that you're playing as Edgeworth. You're, he's living out his his what was originally his dream to be a defense attorney like his father. He doesn't. He seems to kind of downplay it though. Also, he does take over the Magatama, and when you do the usual cyclock things, uh, he calls them psycholocks instead, which is just utterly hilarious. So, yeah, basically Edgeworth investigates stuff. He breaks some psycho locks. The funny thing is though. Uh, he, Cyclox, I believe it was Iris and Lar and Larry, I almost said the wrong name, <laughs> uh, Larry. The hilarious thing is when he starts to break Larry's Cyclox. The first time, you know, it's, that's, that's just the thing. The first time you get some information that Larry saw something interesting while he was, uh, watching the bridge light on fire. He claims to have seen something interesting. You break his Cyclox. But it turns out, he had another layer of Cyclops. And Edra's reaction is just priceless. He's just like, I'm just gonna take you to court and finish you off there. That's basically what he decides to do. But me as the player, every time I get to that section, my gut instinct is just to say, Larry! God! But we go into the trial, and somehow, things only get better. Or worse, depending on how you feel about the prosecutor. It's not Godot, for some reason. We find that out later on. For some reason, it's not Godot. It's Francisca von Karma! Yes, I'm sure you're surprised to hear that name again, but she returns as the prosecutor for the first trial of Bridge to the Turnabout. She gets to bring that whip-happy attitude. But the interesting thing is, she's not quite as... I really don't want to say the word, but bitchy, I guess? She's definitely a lot more reserved compared to how she was during her two trials in, uh, or two cases in Justice for All. She went from being a nearly intolerable character to actually being a very tolerable character and somewhat likable. And if you feel this way now during the trial, well, she does stick around for the rest of the case, for the most part. So, yeah, that's pretty dang interesting. But it's Edgeworth as a defense attorney against Francisca as a prosecutor. And you're wondering, how do they get around that with the judge knowing Edgeworth as a prosecutor and all that? Well, that's probably why they did the Canadian judge thing. He only saw Edgeworth prosecute one case, and then we all know how that case turned out. So, it goes to stand that he might have tried to blur it out of his memory, like any sensible human being would do. As a result, the judge, the Canadian judge, barely remembers Edgeworth. He all, he tries to do it during the trial, but it's quickly quashed. Like, it's, it's quashed by Francisca so bad, it's hilarious. Okay, but for the trial, we get two witnesses to cross-examine with this epic crossover. Uh, Bikini, where... By doing so, we learn more about that the fact that she might have witnessed two irises, potentially. Uh, basically, her testimony is very strange. It's all we can really confirm at this time. But, the trial gets good, or bad, depending on how you look at it, when we get to the second half of the first trial. And we deal with the reintroduction of Lornis Dunham. Oh my god. I'm going to spare you a bit of the pain of having to summarize all of his buttsness and just get to the point that the interesting thing that he observed was noted in the form of a painting. And the painting is questionable enough to be the thing that gets Edgeworth's investigation the one more day that it probably desperately needed. We'll just say that much. There's also plenty of Francisco whipping Larry, which is good. It's fair. He probably needs a whole lot of that after his shenanigans with the painting. Arguably, Loris Donum is a worse character than Larry Butts. The Larry Butts that I came to respect in the original Ace Attorney and Loris Donum are two completely different, yet related, connected characters, to be sure. 
But man, the Edgeworth section in this case, yeah, it's really good. It's also really nice that to have the Edgeworth segment because it really does make this case kind of feel like a two-for-one situation. It really eases the pacing and the tension a lot. And that is one reason why I like this one, Farewell My Turnabout. That one kind of drag is kind of the point is supposed to drag out a little bit because of the kidnapping thing with Maya, but you know, the way they handle the pacing and bridge of the turnabout makes it a lot easier to digest, I feel. But anyways, the second half of Bridge of the Turnabout is where things, you know, we start to see the realness of this case. Because Phoenix is back in business, barely, and we start to learn a lot of stuff. We learn a lot in the investigation, his investigation, but we don't really learn everything until the final trial, which I think is like three hours. I, the final trial, I think, is basically almost half of the ca entire case. Kind of crazy, actually, but it's fitting. It really is, but yeah, we turns out Godot was here the whole time, but he was stuck on the other side where Maya supposedly was. And during this whole thing, Pearl is out doing some weird stuff too. Apparently, you find out that there's a burnt note in the incinerator, and the burnt note was made by Morgan Fay. Remember her? Apparently, Morgan Fay gave a letter to Pearl during one of uh, Pearl's visits to the detention center. And Pearl was trying to follow these instructions. Let's just say she didn't do the best job possible, but she probably did the best job considering her age and reading comprehension and all that stuff. We'll leave it at that. I'm jumping the gun a little bit because that actually happens towards the end of Phoenix's investigation, but... Oh well, this is a retrospective. I can take some liberties here, I feel, if I haven't already taken a bunch of those. We do get a little bit more of freaking Loris Donum, but not that much, honestly. The painting is still important, on the other hand. We will learn more about that during the trial. The rest of the investigation, Francisca actually is Phoenix's assistant. Holy crud. Francisca, of all people, is his assistant for the first half of his investigation. And it's, it's about what you'd expect. It's the more tolerable Francisca. She has some very good moments of character development. Honestly, it's kind of shocking that she went from being, like I said, an, almost an intolerable character in Justice for All to being very respectable in Trials and Tribulations. A bridge to the turnabout, I should say. And you really don't, you don't see it coming. It's not anticipated at all. Anyway, the first investigation, or first half of Phoenix's investigation, ends as you start to figure out who Elise really is. You find out she's actually Misty Faye, Maya and Mia's mother. Holy crud. And then stuff from DL6, from the original Ace Attorney, starts getting dug up again. Not in a major way, just because it becomes relevant again, because that was the case that made Misty go into hiding. So, this is why people consider this a finale to the trilogy, because all of those even remotely loose plot ends are just completely cut up and finished here. Like, the stuff with the DL6 and the Ace Attorney, the stuff with Morgan Fay's plots in Justice for All, every little bit just all comes together here. And it all gets concluded, if not during the investigation, then during the final trial, certainly. And I keep hyping it up, and yeah, I should just start talking about it. Well, there's also a bit of interesting development with Iris, particularly during the midpoint of the of Phoenix's investigation. It seems like Iris is entrusted to release the locks in the sacred chamber, because supposedly Maya might be hidden behind the sacred chamber. We also find out from Godot more about why he apparently hates Phoenix. Apparently Godot hates Phoenix for what he wasn't able to do. He wasn't able to save Mia. wonder what makes you think why would Godot have an attachment to Mia as if the player probably didn't already figure it out. You know, we'll spell it out when we get to the trial. Holy crud, this case is long but it's so good. But there's some interesting stuff going on with Iris. She starts to act different during the middle because there's an earthquake that happens out of nowhere during the middle of the investigation. And it was during this whole mess up that Iris, uh, 
and started to change it at behavior a little bit. And as you would continue to investigate, you have to do a psych lock on Iris again, strangely enough, and also on Pearl, like I mentioned earlier. And you start to find out more about the situation with Iris, but you really don't learn the rest of it until the... It's, it's kind of like what happened with Larry during the Edgeworth's investigation, but a lot less, you know, buttsy. Definitely a lot more fitting and polite, I guess you could say. But yeah, the biggest thing is the revelation with at least Donum being Misty Faye. You also figure out about her little secret weapon, among other things. So you get some interesting revelations to take with you as we head into the final trial. It starts off really bad though, because Iris supposedly confesses to the crime of tampering with the crime scene and being an accomplice to the real murderer. Oh boy! But, it's during this, you find out the real meaning behind the painting that Larry took. Or drew, I should say. The painting doesn't depict Iris flying over the bridge, but actually, Iris flying under the bridge. Also, it's not Iris, it's, it's Misty Faye's corpse, because she was the one that was murdered, you see. So, it turns out, the body was transported via pendulum, via one of the bridge's ropes. Man, if you thought the whole thing with Max Galactica and Turnabout Big Top and how that murder method went down was crazy, this beats it somehow. I mean, this wasn't even the murder method. This was the, bo the corpse transfer method, and it's somehow crazier than the murder method of one of the craziest cases in the series. And, and, and it might even, I would say in the bad way, but you know. But yeah, wow. But after you learn about that, you start learning about the other stuff with Iris. Towards the end though, the testimony that Iris gives starts to become more and more contradictory. It really starts to hit you what went down in Hazakura Temple. Because the final trial is split into three chunks. And the second chunk, we find out the Irish that's testifying in court is actually Dahlia Hawthorne. Because she was executed. And her spirit was channeled by someone. Uh, oh boy. Just to save you all some time a little bit, basically, Dahlia talks about how evil she is, about what happened in Hazakura Temple. Mia shows up in Pearl's body to deliver the fatal blow of revelation to Dahlia. That she always was and always will be a failure, even in death. And Mia will always be there to take her down. And it's just, the breakdown that Dahlia's spirit does, I would say is the best breakdown in the trilogy. It's just such a statement, it really is. And to go from Tigre's breakdown, arguably, since there wasn't really a breakdown in Turnabout Beginnings, to this... Even though, you know, Recipe for Turnabout was a filler. It's a suitable, it's a suitable upgrade, let me tell you that much. But, yeah, I, I kind of abridged that whole arc a good bit. But, yeah, Dahlia gets taken down very, very aptly. And you think that would be the end of the case. But just because Dahlia is evil, and she did some evil things, doesn't mean that she was the one who murdered Misty Fay. Crazy, I know. But it turns out, Dahlia was channeled by Maya the whole time. Oh man, Maya just can't seem to cut a break with all these final cases, huh? Turnabout Goodbyes was the only one where she really had a somewhat significant role. She wasn't in Rise from the Ashes. She was kidnapped in Pharaoh My Turnabout. And here we come to Bridge to the Turnabout. She's barely in it again until the end. Turns out, she's the final witness. Oh my, the final witness of the trilogy! Also, fun fact, I forgot to mention earlier, Pearl is actually the last character you do a Cyclops break on in the trilogy as well. Kind of an interesting coincidence, huh? The Face Sisters are actually the last characters you truly delve deep dive into, in a, in a way. It's very interesting how that was handled, but basically the whole final chunk of the trial is dedicated to Maya's testimony as to what she saw 
uh, in the garden next to the sacred chamber. And well, you find out Godot was there the whole time. Godot knew about the plan with Morgan because of his connections. Um, he may have had something to do with the murder. Turns out he was the one that murdered Misty Fade. But it was technically Misty Fade channeling Dahlia. So he wasn't trying to murder Misty Fade. He was trying to murder Dahlia, even though she was already technically dead. You see, he has rage towards Dahlia because of what happened to him. She was the one that poisoned him when he was Diego Armando, right? Because he was trying to poke his nose where it didn't belong. And Dahlia fought back, and Diego was put into a coma. And once he woke up, he woke up to the news that the love of his life, Mia Faye, was dead. It's, it's a shame, really. And he blames Phoenix because Phoenix totally could have been there to save the day even though he showed up too late. And the player knows this, but Godot does not, you know. And that's a whole thing with the trial. So, the big epic finale is that you need to present Godot's profile because uh, Dahlia in the body of Misty fought back with a dagger. And she used the dagger to stab Godot behind his mask somehow. So you have to present his profile, which can be a bit of a curveball for a player, I'm not gonna lie. Uh, I, the first time I did this case, I'm guilty of basically save scumming and trying everything because I never would have thought to present Godot's profile again because you have to present it so many times during that chunk of the trial. But yeah, you present Godot's profile you get an epic moment out of nowhere where the corner theme from the original game starts playing. For some reason, they just abandoned the Trial of Tribulations corner theme for that one moment to make everything really come full circle. And you deliver the final crushing blow to Godot. But is Godot really a fitting final villain for the trilogy? I don't know about that, but... You know, I think he'd sit, he's just fine because he's a really morally ambiguous character at this point. He has seems to have good motivations, but the way he goes about executing the motivations is not is probably could have been handled better if he had more thought and clarity. But given his situation, can we really blame the man? Ah, poor Godot. So that is all it really is to Rift and Turnabout. That's how you find out who the true murderer is. This is just brilliant. This is uh, the, uh, the author, I will say the author, Shu Takumi. I think this case is his best work, honestly. I would say the original Ace Attorney as a whole is probably a good, good example too, but that was his first of this type, so you know. This British to turn about, it's just, an, it's a great ride from beginning to end. The whole trilogy really is a great ride from beginning to end. Yes, there's a couple of bumps on the road, but the destination is so worth it. And I love this series, this series so much. I've never been a huge advocate or fan of story in video games, mostly if it's taking away from the gameplay. However, if there's one thing I learned from Ace Attorney, at least the Ace Attorney series, is that if there's a really good story to tell, then they should tell it. And the gameplay is really rather minimal, so I feel like Ace Attorney, for me, is the polar opposite of what I usually want from a video game experience. I don't want the story to ever be a major focus if the gameplay is something really good and enjoyable. There are cases where I've played games that do strike a pretty decent balance, but it's I can only think of a couple of series that do that really well in my eyes. For the most part, if I play a game, I expect it to have good gameplay, and even if it has a bad story, if it has great gameplay, I will stomach it. However, if a game like Ace Attorney has a bad story and bad gameplay, then I'm not going to want to mess with it. But Ace Attorney, I feel, has a great story. And the gameplay is there just enough to make the whole thing more compelling to go through. 
Yeah, it's rather long at times, but because you're mostly just sifting through dialogue, I find that it's not as taxing of an experience as it would be to play a more involved game, like, you know, a platform or something like that. As a whole, though, I have to say Ace Attorney, brilliant. If I had to rank the three games in the trilogy, uh, with Rise from the Ashes being its own thing, I consider the original my favorite. Trials and Tribulations is dead right behind it. Uh, Justice for All as a whole is right behind that. And Rise from the Ashes as its own thing is behind all that. You know? If I were to consider Rise from the Ashes in, in the same block as the original Ace Attorney, which is logical to do, well, it's still my favorite. You know, That one is just the most solid experience, I feel. But I do recommend Trials and Tribulations as well. I don't know if I can recommend it as a standalone experience. It's not the worst thing to do since that's how I started with the series. But if you play the whole trilogy, it's superior to playing any one of these games by themselves. That said, if someone played through the original, they were like, Oh, I enjoyed it well enough, but I'm willing to stop here. That's still a perfectly acceptable stopping point. A one-and-done experience for some people, because Ace Attorney, to me, is really one of a kind. Mm -hmm.